Hello and welcome. Welcome to this ABF Online. Uh, for those who are visiting, I am Bert Spaulding, and uh, this is our uh, Cornerstone Baptist Church of Roseville, Michigan, Koinonia Adult Bible Fellowship lesson for March 15, 2020. Uh, in this uh, in this first lesson of this series, uh, I'm going to be introducing our new series, uh, which is the study of First Peter, which we're calling Hope Set on Grace. And in this introduction, I will go through uh, just some of the introductory materials or information for this initial uh, lesson in our ABF. So this is... Uh, for and designed for uh, the folks in the Koinonia Adult Bible Fellowship or ABF at Cornerstone Baptist Church in Roseville, Michigan. This is a conversation, not a podcast. So a uh, big part of this uh, ABF online is that uh, you would find your way to the Facebook group, uh, the Koinonia Facebook group, and I have the link uh, posted here, and you'll find it posted elsewhere. Uh, it's just facebook.com slash groups slash koinonia abf at cbc. And it's important that uh, you would consider joining the group if you haven't already and do some follow-up conversation uh, with us uh, as part of the follow-up to this lesson itself. It's actually the conversation that takes place as part of the lesson. Um, I'm Bert Spaulding. Uh, I'm one of the teachers in our ABF. And you're welcome to contact me with any questions, uh, suggestions, or anything else at spaldingcpe at gmail.com. Our hope is that uh, we'll have as few of these online ABFs as possible. And just like in the Jewish tradition at the Seder, the Passover Seder, uh, the, the exclamation or, or expression is, next year in Jerusalem? Well, we want to say next week in Jerusalem. We hope that, uh, we hope that soon we will be back together physically uh, at, our, at our church, at our ABF, uh, which is in room 282 and 930 on Sunday mornings, and hoping to finish up the reading and studying the Bible, our ASTB. Uh, series that Mike has been teaching. Uh, so w once we start meeting again in person, we'll do that and then we'll f come back and, and, and in person do this series that we're working on now. So so welcome. Um, so this series that we're just starting is a series on First Peter and it's called Hope Set on Grace. That's kind of the theme uh, and, and it come, that comes from First Peter 1.13. And in this lesson, I'm just going to introduce the series and uh, kind of talk a little bit about the relevance of the, of First Peter in these times that we're facing right now. Um, and we're going to be talking a lot about hope. Uh, First Peter is about hope and holiness, actually both, but uh, holiness is is uh, only activated, uh, it seems, uh, when one has hope. Um, and and that hope uh, is connected with God's grace. So so hope and holiness connected to God's grace, is sort of a theme that works itself through First Peter. So I want to start a little bit about talking about hope, and to start out with saying hope is not wishful thinking. If if hope was wishful thinking, then it wouldn't really be hope. Um, and right now there's a lot of wishful thinking going on. Um, the problem is that, uh, that reality, uh, whether it's the coronavirus uh, pandemic uh, or just the other challenges of life that we have, uh, uh, there, are, there are a lot of reality checks that, that, that remind us that wishful thinking just doesn't get us where we, want it, where we need to be. And death is the ultimate reality check. And so as we as we think about pandemics and flus and Spanish flus and, and, and then the, the other sort of everyday issues that we face with health and everything else, death is the ultimate reality check. And, and really, uh, without, without some sense of, of what life and death really is and what's the real sense of that and the meaning of that, 
uh, and, and, and recognizing we have no control over death at the end of the day. Uh, no control, uh, if, if no one is in control, then it's, then it's hard to come up with some notion of hope. So, uh, so that's just kind of a, you know, a depressing backdrop to, to what we want to think about. You often hear the expression today, you do you. And, uh, and there's really two extremes to that. Uh, one way of you doing you uh, is, is wishful thinking. It's having kind of a disconnect from reality. Uh, for some folks, and we probably call them wishful thinkers, you do you uh, seems to involve living in denial about the diligence and the effort and the resourcefulness required to flourish in life. Uh, it's kind of the sense of, I only want to do what I want to do. And uh, and uh, I don't want to take precautions. I don't I don't I don't want to have to uh, be expected to do anything. I don't want to have to be expected to uh, follow any particular rules or protocols. I just want to be me, and and I and I'm kind of hoping that life will just go on and be wonderful, and there won't be a problem. It kind of reminds me, and as I think about the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic. It kind of reminds me of the video that you've probably seen of the little girl uh, with her uh, uh, licking the hand, licking the railing at the um, uh, at the uh, I don't know if it's a McDonald's or whatever it is. Uh, there it is. You know. Oh my goodness. What does coronavirus taste like anyway? Uh, so uh, you know, do what I want to do and and hope for the best, in the sense, wishfully think for the best. That's sort of one extreme. Another extreme of you doing you is, is really trying to, desperately to have control. We might call those folks, instead of wishful thinkers, we might call them overthinkers. Uh, for them, you do you seems to involve trying to be as energetic and diligent and resourceful as possible in order to flourish in life. The problem is we can't really control everything in life. We might try to, uh, but we just can't. Uh, and, and that actually reminds me of another uh, video that you've probably seen of, of folks fi fighting, oh my goodness, fighting over toilet paper. Oh, goodness, goodness. Um, you know, what happens when life is so out of control, I, 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 I become desperate. I become like a ferocious animal, in a sense, trying to uh, uh, scrap around and get what I can. I'm not equating people with animals. I'm just saying that we uh, we sometimes find ourselves just desperately trying to control as much as we can. And uh, and so that's sort of the other extreme. So you have you have the sense of I need to do what I need to do to make things just perfect and right. And, and that can be very frustrating. There's actually a, an article in an academic journal uh, called Psychological Bulletin. Uh, an article was recently published uh, by Thomas Curran and Andrew Hill. And it's an article that talks about uh, millennials in particular and Gen Z. Uh, and the sense that, uh, that there is this, this tension between uh, just attempting to be relaxed and cavalier and cool and just everything is good and what it takes to get there and the kind of sort of effort at at perfecting uh, the, the the lifestyle of being relaxed and and hip and cool and it actually creates a fair amount of depression uh, it's a psychological uh, issue because it really amounts to perfectionism and we just can't seem to get the control that we need, uh, that we think we need over life, uh, and it becomes very frustrating. And so there's really a tension uh, that almost, if you could think about some football uprights, you doing you, uh, on, on the one extreme, uh, I only want to do what I want to do. If I want to lick the handrail, I lick the handrail. I mean, whatever. And uh, if I don't want to lick the handrail, that's fine too. Uh, and that, of course, disconnects me from reality. The other extreme is um, I just can't seem to really get a control. I can't control my health. I can't control uh, what happens ultimately, even with with finances. I mean, the the, the you know with with you know the, even the dollar itself and 
and, uh, and the possible collapse of the currency, uh, let alone uh, trying to manage my own personal finances and, and running into problem after problem as we go along, the trajectory of my career, the tra direct trajectory of my, my social life, uh, social engagement, uh, and uh, sometimes I find myself lonely and sad and alone and depressed and at odds with people, family, friends, and, uh, other people. I mean, life just, the wheels just, life has a tendency to have the wheels fall off, and it's hard for me to find that sort of middle ground, and so uh, and so that's what I strive for. I strive to, to navigate reality and, and navigate between being disconnected with life and sort of disappointed with life, um, and that's really, in a sense, uh, how we how we go through life in a lot of ways. Uh, and the bell curve uh, that, that you see is this notion that uh, many, many times I get it right. Many times I navigate, I make good decisions, and, 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 and they have good results. Uh, but sometimes I'm just kind of foolish and, and wishful thinking, and I make decisions that seem to uh, signif signal or signify that I don't have a real good handle on the reality here. I'm, I'm driving with, uh, you know, I haven't changed my oil in, in uh, you know, 12,000 miles, uh, and, uh, and I'm disconnected from reality. On the other hand, uh, uh, we sometimes find that no matter what we do with our health, our diet, our exercise, our sleep, our, uh, you know, trying to protect ourselves from viruses and, and, and flus and everything else, it doesn't matter. Uh, I, I still get sick or I still run into financial challenges or I still discover that my career is, uh, instead of on an upward trajectory, all of a sudden it's downward or just even plateaued. Uh, my, my time is just, management is just getting out of hand. Uh, or my social uh, engagement, uh, whatever it is. I, I just run into disappointments in life. And, and unfortunately, it seems sometimes like life offers more disappointments than just about anything else. Uh, but many times I'm able to navigate uh, and, and not be stuck at one end or the other. Uh, the, the problem is that all of this gets me to the point where I begin to ask, what's this all about anyway? What's, what's the reality all about anyway? And there really are two possible answers to that question. One possible answer to that question is nada. It's not about anything. There is no, in a sense, uh, there, there, there's no creator. Uh, the, 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 the world and life and the universe just sort of popped up out of nothing by itself. Uh, time plus chance plus some kind of way of creating matter or, or arriving at matter just happened. Uh, and so there's no creation, there's no design, uh, there was no intention of me being here. I just showed up. It was just a, an accident of time and, and, uh, and uh, nature taking its course, which would mean there's no real moral truth. Um, and it means there's no ultimate purpose. There's just a sense of dread, a sense of, of there's just nothing there. Uh, and, and so... Uh, when I when I really think about what it means to try to navigate reality in light of that paradigm, that worldview, uh, I just it's like it doesn't make sense. Uh, why bother navigating, trying to navigate reality? At the end of the day, uh, it, you know, it, it, there's no purpose, and really, at the end of the day, we just all die. And so that's one perspective, uh, one sense of reality. It's the one promoted by culture very often, at least Western culture likes to promote that. Um, but it really results in their, uh, this idea of, of there being hopelessness. And what's kind of interesting is that when you have something like a pandemic, uh, like, like we're having now as I'm recording this in, in March of 2020, when you have something like a pandemic, that's a reality check. And it gets people thinking. It gets people thinking, is, is it really true that there's no creator? Is it really true there's no design? I mean, everything is, uh, the, the, you know, the distance of the earth from the sun is, is so precise that just even in the curvature of the earth, 
Uh, we have entirely different climates. Uh, the climate in Michigan is entirely different than the climate in Florida, uh, which is just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit closer to the sun uh, in, in terms of uh, the curvature of the Earth. And when you consider that, that, that distance as compared to the distance between the Earth and itself and the sun, it's an infinitesimal difference. The sort of fine tuning of just everything, and the, the more you study physics and and, and, and microbiology and and, and uh, molecular uh, cellular cellular molecular biology, the more you dig down and, and dig in, and the more you look out, uh, the, the, you, it's 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 impossible to say there's no design or no designer, and and moral truth. We we all know there's moral truth. At the end of the day, you know it's kind of interesting. Uh, uh, in, in today's expression sometimes, sometimes folks are hesitant to say, well, that's just wrong, or that's just evil. They don't want to be judge judgmental. But you know what they say? They say, not cool. That is not cool. All right, but what are you really saying? You're saying that's wrong. What you're doing or what you did is just wrong. There's no moral justification for it. So we know there is such a thing as moral truth, even if we try to sort of uh, smooth it over with, with saying, well, it's just not cool. Uh, we really mean it's wrong. Uh, and, then, uh, and then it's difficult to, to really think that there's no purpose uh, and that all there is is just sort of a dread of the unknown, uh, which is really epitomized by the notion of death. Difficult to do that. So, so that's, you know, one view is there's, there's none of those things. There's no creation, no design, no moral truth, no purpose, only dread. The other point of view is there must be a creator. There must be uh, some kind of designer. Um, we are persons. You are a person. I am a person. Everybody in our Adult Bible Fellowship, our Kononia Fellowship, are persons. Everybody we know is a person. And every person has a different personality. And where does that all come from? It, you know, it, what makes us all so different, so thoughtful in different ways, we observe different things, uh, we bring to bear a, a different sense of what's important, what the priorities are, we align our priorities slightly differently from one person to the next. Where does that personality come from? Where does that character come from? And that takes us to the other, there's only one other point of view, and that is there is a creator. Uh, there is a there is a God. There is a designer. Uh, there is a source of moral truth that we map to when we try to understand morality. Uh, there is a sense of purpose, and that's the story of the Bible. The story of the Bible is the story of creation. Uh, there is it's the story of how human beings were created with free will, uh, but then we chose uh, to to rebel against our Creator. And that puts us at odds with our Creator, and it, it 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 creates and explains a lot of the problems that we see as we as we navigate through life. That's the other that's the other viewpoint. And uh, and so uh, the the story of the Bible, the viewpoint of the Bible and the gospel is that there is hope, which means there's no dread. There's hope. Hope is the opposite of dread, existential dread, in a sense. Uh, and so uh, the Bible tells us there is creation, there is design, there is moral truth, there is ultimate purpose, and the gospel tells us there is redemption. There, there, there is a story of rebellion which explains much of the evil in the world, the evil in our hearts, uh, but there is also redemption. So that's, that's the story of the gospel, and it's the story of redemption. And uh, it's, a, it's a rediscovering of reality. Uh, yes, there are sort of moral goalposts. There, are, there is a right and wrong. Your either field goal either kicker either gets the field goal or doesn't. There is a right or a wrong. And that's a sort of a redis rediscovery of, of reality, in a sense. And the story of, of Jesus Christ is the story of, of reality having been navigated perfectly. Uh, and so uh, while I tend to drift sometimes in the direction of I only want to do what I want to do when I want to do it and, I, and it disconnects me from reality and I find myself licking the handrail. Or on the other hand, I can't seem to get it right. I can't seem to do enough. I can't seem to fix 
uh, the, the, the sort of the, the, the moral landscape in my own heart. Uh, but the story of the gospel is that's been done for you should you trust in the one who did it, which is who is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And so instead of saying you do you, it's you do love. You do love. Uh, we love because he first loved us. And so that's uh, that's that's sort of the backdrop. That's sort of the 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 the, the baseline or the starting point uh, to understand this series, which we're going through, which is uh, the the epistle uh, in the Bible in the New Testament called First Peter. And what we what we notice is that we yearn for hope uh, in in the face of a life that that just has. A lot of surprises, a lot of disappointments, and frankly, a lot of suffering. We run into health issues, and we find ourselves, in a sense, suffering. Uh, we experience job loss and layoffs and, and, and financial challenges, and, and, we, and, and it bothers us. We, we, literally, we suffer in the midst of that. Uh, we run into family crisis, relationship difficulties, loneliness sometimes, depression, and rejection, and and we suffer from that. And so First Peter, if, if, that's, if that's been true for you ever, <laughs> and I know it has, it's true for all of us, uh, but First Peter is a great place to look uh, to sort of get, get a sense of, of how, where is the empathy in the gospel and in the Bible? And, and First Peter just lays out that empathy for us because First Peter is a book written to those who are suffering. Uh, and we see that all through the book. Uh, we see uh, that uh, uh, Peter talks about being grieved by various trials. If you've been grieved by a trial, uh, he talks about being, uh, Peter talks about being accused of doing evil. Has that ever happened to you? Uh, he talks about suffering unjustly. Uh, being slandered, being reviled, and even suffering for doing good, um, and and he 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 comes up with a kind of a metaphor of calling it a fiery trial, sort of a sort of a, a spiritual version of of being put into a furnace, uh, which is an allusion to a, a, a story in the Old Testament. Uh, sometimes uh, we suffer for doing good. Sometimes we're accused of doing bad. And we're, and we're treated as if we were a murderer or a thief. Uh, and, 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 and as we look around, we discover that to the extent that we're, we suffer because of our faith, welcome to the club. We, we are part of a worldwide historical persecution that was, that was ex experienced by Christ himself. And Christ told us that we could expect that persecution as being a follower of Christ. So, so Peter is writing to those who are suffering. Um, and, uh, and, he, and he's writing to uh, actually uh, folks in what we would call today Asia Minor or, or Turkey, uh, parts of Turkey. It's the same sort of region, the same group, the same new churches uh, that Pastor Bob is and the other pastors who have, who have uh, also been part of the series have been filling in uh, the Pastor Bob has been walking through in the book of Acts. Uh, because in the first part of the book of Acts, we have Peter at the Pentecost and in in his sermon and some of his early activities. And then Paul comes into the picture. And both of them uh, are, are very much connected to and writing to and speaking to and encouraging the Christians, as, as, as Peter says, in the diaspora, those who are dispersed. Some of them have left Rome and have needed to go out into the hinterland, if you will, uh, because of persecution, whether it was Nero uh, or, or Nemesian, uh, wh whichever em em emperors uh, were particularly persecuting Christians at the moment. Uh, at the end of the day, we have the churches spread out through uh, uh, Anatolia or a Asia Minor, we would call it today, uh, in Bithynia and Pontus and Phrygia, Galatia, Cappadocia, Pamphylia, in some of the very cities that uh, that we read about in the book of Acts that we've been 
been taught about as we've been going through the book of Acts. These are the Christians that Peter is writing to, and he's probably writing to them from Rome, which he alludes to as Babylon. Uh, and, uh, and 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 that, that might be code language. It, it could well be code language. He doesn't want to say Rome because he's already he's already uh, in you know under the the microscope uh, of of persecution in Rome. But he's speaking to, to Christians who are suffering. Some are just cr- uh, suffering because they're they're exiles and they're and they're and they're sojourners and they're and they're, and they're, they're basically refugees and they're they're physically. Uh, suffering. Uh, some are suffering because of actual persecution because of their faith. Uh, but all of them are going through this, just the trials of life. And this letter, 1 Peter, is a letter of hope and of encouragement. The, the, the notion of hope and encouragement goes through the entire letter. Uh, in the very beginning, verse 3, uh, Peter says, Blessed be God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What a tightly packed sentence. And we're going to actually come back to that in the next lesson uh, next week. We'll come back and, and, and talk about this verse and just we're going to unpack it a little bit but notion note notice there's this idea of a living hope uh that's that's a very much a part of uh this verse and then uh, down a few more verses therefore preparing your minds for action and and this is a thought-provoking letter this first epistle of peter uh preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded uh People are a little more sober-minded in the in, in you know in, when facing a pandemic that might otherwise be the case. Uh, so being sober-minded isn't as much of a reach today as it might have been just even a couple of months ago. Being sober-minded, set your hope. Notice that there is a this hope is not just a condition; it's an instruction. <laughs> set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So there is a forward-lookingness. And an immediate notion of of sort of an existential, you know, set your hope, rest on the hope uh, that comes from the grace that comes from Christ. A little further down in the first chapter, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. There it is. There is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The one who has made known. He walked the earth. He lived that. He navigated reality perfectly. Never never going in either direction of, of being, you know, uh, a, a, a wishful thinker on the one hand or... Uh, an overthinker on the other. He 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 nailed it. He 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 walked a life perfectly. And then the expression "nailed it" is is, you know, like leads right to the notion of yeah, he was nailed. He was nailed to the cross, uh, uh, and uh, and suffered and died uh, in propitiation uh, for our sins. And so uh, that is the hope. So that your faith and hope are in God by way of Jesus Christ. So so that notion of the gospel is woven through 1 Peter. I can't I can't uh, finish this this uh, lesson by not going quickly to uh, chapter 3 verse 15 of 1 Peter uh, because as you know those I mean there are some visitors uh, in in today but uh, online but uh, for those in our ABF you know that uh, that I've been engaged very much in apologetics, and this is sort of the commissioning uh, verse of apologetics. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope. So hope is, it's about the future, it's about the future grace, it's about existing grace, and it's about uh, uh, being able to articulate that hope for others. The world desperately needs hope. And, and so uh, we, we want to be living a life that, that signals, that manifests, that shows, that displays, that puts on display that hope. 
Why? So people will ask us. Have you been asked? Has someone said, "How do you how do you get through this coronavirus thing?" And you just you just you're not panicked. You just you're content. You're you're at peace. How does that work? Has anyone anyone asked you that yet? Uh, or just how you face any other kind of crisis uh, in your life. Uh, that's what we want. That's what we want to strive for. That's what we're commissioned to do. We're commissioned, first of all, to to trust and obey, but then to let that be reflected in everything in our life, so that we get asked, so that we can offer the reason for the hope uh, that is in us, and to do it with gentleness and respect. Well, that's just a, an introduction to the introduction. It's a, it's, a, it's a startup introduction to the series and a startup introduction to First Peter. Uh, but this, as I said at the outset, is, is a conversation, not a podcast. So I need to encourage you to participate in a conversation. And the way to do that is to go to the Facebook uh, group page for, Coin, for our Koinonia uh, group. Uh, and ask to join the group. Uh, if you are a member of Cornerstone or a regular attender, if you are in our Cornerstone Connect uh, directory, uh, then uh, then that sort of qualifies you to, uh, to, to ask to be admitted to the Facebook group. Uh, if you've been attending Cornerstone Baptist Church in Roseville and you haven't uh, yet been included in the Cornerstone Connect online directory, uh, just call the church or stop by and uh, we can make those arrangements so that you can participate uh, in the Facebook group. Uh, but uh, the Facebook group question, discussion question uh, for this week is 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 follows. is to describe any recent situation or situations where you have had the opportunity to offer encouragement or hope to someone concerned about the COVID-19 or coronavirus novel coronavirus pandemic. Have, have you had that conversation? Have you been, uh, and, and it might be with, with someone where it's just simply you, you've, you've been able to offer uh, to help them out with, with something. Maybe bring something, uh, some supplies to their home if they are self-isolating or quarantining. Uh, maybe just a word of encouragement. Maybe you've had the opportunity to, uh, in, the, in that context, to, to really talk about Christ uh, and to share the gospel uh, or not just and it might have been an, a believer that you've shared the gospel with or, 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 or you have shared encouragement or hope with or an unbeliever um, either way um, uh, share that experience uh, in the Facebook group uh, and the uh, and the address for the Facebook group is at the bottom of the screen it's facebook.com slash groups slash koinonia abf at CBC, uh, and uh, uh, you'll see that link elsewhere as well. Uh, but that's uh, uh, please be part of the conversation, uh, and uh, and invite you to do that. Uh, for next week, uh, there's homework, and that is to pull up your study Bible. Uh, most of us have a study Bible, especially after. Uh, the series uh, reading and studying the Bible that Mike has been uh, leading us through. Uh, if you don't have a study Bible, look into getting one. Uh, one of the first study Bibles that, that I recommend to anyone, no matter what their age, is called the ESV, uh, uh, the English Standard Version, the ESV Student Study Bible. It's, a, it's fairly inexpensive. Uh, you can get it in paperback. It's available on Kindle. It's a good starting study Bible, but most of you have a study Bible. So in your study Bible, go to First Peter and then back up a page <laughs> and read whatever the editor has provided as an introduction to First Peter. He'll talk about who Peter is. He'll talk about uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the extent to which we are confident that, that uh, Peter the Apostle, who identifies himself as Peter the Apostle, Apostle is actually the author of First Peter. Uh, and what some of the challenges to that authorship might have been, if that's discussed in your study Bible. Uh, it'll talk about uh, his audience, talk about when it was written. Uh, it may mention uh, the Roman emperor at the time. It might say Nero. It might say Domitian. Uh, it might say a little of both or one or the other. Uh, it might talk about the, the, the Christians in the diaspora. The, and it may, talk, it may even talk about, which we'll talk about next week, what, is he, what does he mean when he says elect? 
And that actually might, if you look in the first, the first couple of verses and you see that word elect, just look in the footnote and see what it says about that. So, so, so read the introduction and then read all of chapter 1 of 1 Peter. Just, just it'd take you four minutes. Just read through it and maybe even read through it a couple times just to kind of get a sense of comfort with that chapter. And, uh, and we'll start into it. As far as a book, if you... Uh, are looking for a book. Uh, um, John MacArthur has a, a commentary on one and two Peter, first and second Peter, uh, which is very inexpensive. It's a, uh, you can get a used copy for almost nothing. It's also available on Kindle. Uh, that would be a good book to accompany this series, but mainly your study Bible and just your own uh, studious reading and, and applying some of the th techniques that we've learned from Mike uh, in the reading and, and uh, uh, studying the Bible series. I encourage you to employ some of those uh, as well. And then participate in the Facebook group, uh, and that'll, that'll get us where we uh, need to go. I'm going to close in prayer, uh, but I want to encourage you to, uh, to let this be uh, an ABF. If you're visiting from another ABF at Cornerstone, welcome. I hope you'll go back to your own ABF once we start meeting again. But you're in the meantime, welcome to participate in, in a Koinonia ABF online. And you're welcome to ask to join the Koinonia Facebook group uh, uh, and, uh, and, and share in our, and encourage to share in our discussion. Uh, if you're viewing this and you're not a part of our church family, uh, I hope you enjoy uh, the lesson. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and I hope that you will also take some time to uh, spend some time in First Peter and to spend some time thinking through and, and, and reading through uh, other parts of the New Testament, particularly maybe the Gospel of John, uh, and, to, uh, and to allow uh, the hope of the story and the, of Christ, the good news of Christ, uh, to, be, to be very much a part of your life as well. So, uh, so I welcome you to enjoy these lessons, even if you wouldn't be part of our actual Facebook group because uh, you're not part of our church family. We, we love you, but, you uh, but, but this is designed primarily as an online version of our Adult Bible Fellowship. So thank you. Uh, Father God in heaven, we just thank you for uh, the gospel. We thank you for your word. Uh, we thank you for this opportunity to interact with each other, even as we're not able to in person. Uh, we can interact online, help each of us be an encouragement to each other through Christ, and let our hope be set on grace. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.